Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter number 29, odd text for a series in Daniel, (laughs) we'll talk about that here in just a minute, Jeremiah chapter number 29 this morning, how do you stand in a fallen world? How do you become a person of spiritual integrity in an incredibly seductive culture? How can you remain in the world and not become of the world, like the world? Listen, how can you be a Christian in 2014 and work a job in America and live in a neighborhood in Grand Prairie and interact with people every single day that don't know Jesus Christ, how can you do all that bombarded by billboard, television, movie screen, media of every sort that preaches the gospel of live for money, live for sex, live for sports, live for amusements, live for love, right? How can you be a Christian living in this world and not simply get absorbed into it? How can you keep from becoming spiritually irrelevant? That's the questions we've been asking over the past month in our series called Daniel, Standing in a Fallen World. And and we found some answers, I believe, in an amazing Old Testament book that, that, if you've not been with us, is the story that back in 605 B.C., Babylon, the world power, comes along and conquers the Jews and the city of Jerusalem. Instead of killing them all, Babylon had a practice of deportation. They would take the young, the beautiful, the bright, the intelligent, the gifted, and they would cart them back to Babylon and give them Babylonian names, a Babylonian education, Babylonian food, and would try not to obliterate them, but to assimilate them. And so over the past month, we've been really looking at the story of these four young Jewish men. They couldn't have been more than 15 years old at the time. uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, they would have their names changed to Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. These guys at 15 are plucked out of Jerusalem, taken away to Babylon, and listen, Babylon doesn't try to cut off their head. Babylon doesn't try to break them down. Babylon brings them into a friendly captivity. It's all smiles. It's all hugs. It's all friendly. It's all, look at what we can offer you. And these young men, listen, they stand on the brink of simply becoming Babylonian. They stand on the brink of simply becoming spiritually irrelevant, no different than the people around them. But here's the deal. We found through these six chapters of Daniel, that's not what happens. These four young guys stand in a fallen world. They stay true to Almighty God in that fallen culture. And we observed a couple of ways that they did that so we might learn from it. We observe that, listen, if we're going to stand in a fallen world, we must resolve some things. We must make up our mind about some things. We're not going to be perfect. We're not going to do it right every day. We're we're not going to be able to stand strong in every area of life all the time. We're human. We're banged up. That's the way it is. But in a few areas, we must resolve, y'all. we got to take it by the throat we got to go for the jugular. we got to get deadly serious about a couple of things. We saw two of them over the last few weeks that Daniel and those, those three young men resolved that we must resolve if we're going to stand in a fallen world. Resolve number one, by the grace of God, I will wage war on my idols. Anything. Listen, our desires are not wrong. Our desire for amusement... Our desire for the next technological device, our sexual desires, our financial desire, the desire in and of itself isn't wrong. 
our desires aren't wrong, but they are ambitious. They always want to climb up and take over. They always want to offer you more than they can give. That's why some people, listen, they go to the shopping mall not to pick up a few things, but to try to find life. Right? We go to the refrigerator not to get nourishment, but because we're bored and unhappy and we're trying to find life. We get involved in things. We, listen, Americans and Christians all over the face of the globe go to the internet and get involved in the darkest kind of pornography, trying to find life. They're lonely, they're broken, and they're trying to find life in those places. And here's the thing, that, those things can't give you life. If we're going to stand in a fallen world, we've got to declare war on the things that try to become God in our existence. Does that make sense? Here's the second resolve. Resolve number two. By the grace of God, I will make some daily practices non-negotiable. On a couple of these things, it's not a debate. It's not if I get around to it. If I don't do these things, I fall. If I don't do these things, Babylon is going to beat me down every time. And listen, I love you. I want to be honest with you. If there's not a couple of non-negotiables in your life, let me describe your life to you. You are constantly being beat down by some appetite. You're constantly like back in the same circle of warfare in your marriage. Back in the same circle of maybe looking at the wrong stuff or taking the wrong stuff or turning to the wrong things or debt or whatever it is. We talked about, listen, there's a few staples. The Word of God has got to become a non-negotiable for you. Prayer, time with God has got to become a non-negotiable for you and I. The house of God, I'm telling you, a few years back I was shyer than I am now. And I might have blushed to say this because it sounds so self-serving. I don't believe you can live for Christ in America 2014 if you are not deeply involved in a church. You can disagree with me. When you get to heaven, you'll know I'm right. (laughs) How hard is that, right? Okay. Okay. Here's the thing. By the grace of God, I'll wage war on my idols. By the grace of God, I'll make some daily practices non-negotiable. But here's where we're at this morning. You can keep those two resolves and still wind up living a very self-centered life. You can keep those two resolves. Here's what I'm talking about. You can... Not be involved in worldly things. You're not all tied up and trying to get life from media or sports. You're not getting drunk. You're not taking drugs. You're not sleeping around. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. And you are reading your Bible and you are going to church and you are on your knees in prayer and you are. You can do both those lists of things and still be spiritually irrelevant if not for the third resolve, and it's an unlikely one this morning. How many of you still with me? Say amen. Amen. Resolve number three. By the grace of God, I will remember my mission in life. Jeremiah chapter 29 is is a fascinating text. And, And let me set up for you what's going on. By now, if you've been with us at all, you know I've talked about it at length. The Babylonian philosophy, the world's philosophy. We want to bring you in. We want to assimilate you. Come and be like us. Go where we go. Love what we love. Do what we do. Assimilation. But the Jews in captivity were also hearing another philosophy on a regular basis. There were certain quote unquote prophets, wise men in the captivity that were spreading word to all the people listen, We're not going to be in Babylon very long, okay? God's punishing us, and that's why we're here, but we're only going to be here a couple of years, and he's going to knock them down, and he's going to get us out of here and rescue us. So here's the deal, Israel, don't get too comfortable here, okay? Don't build homes, don't have kids, don't don't like care about them or serve them or help them or get friendly with them. Stay distinct, stay separate, because we won't be here long. 
Okay? If the Babylonian philosophy was to basically bring you in and assimilate you, assimilation, this Jewish philosophy was segregation. Don't have anything to do with Babylon. Use it for its food, use it for its education, use it for whatever, but you stay away from them. Here's the deal. So God has his prophet Jeremiah write a letter. Jeremiah's still back in Jerusalem. So Jeremiah, I want you to write a letter to the Jews in captivity in Babylon. And I want you to tell them how I feel and what I want them to do while they're in Babylon. Okay, here's the letter. Look at this. Jeremiah 29, verse 1. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives, and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. There's a little more description, but go down to verse 4. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and have sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased in Babylon and not diminished or decreased. And seek the peace of the city whither I've caused you to be carried away captives. Seek the peace of Babylon and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof, in Babylon's peace, shall you have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken you to the dreams which you you cause to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I'm not coming back in two years, I'm coming back in 70 years, I will visit you. And perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place, to Jerusalem. And here's one of the most beautiful, famous verses in the Bible. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Some translations say to give you a future and hope. And I'm telling you, when they got that letter... It shocked the fire out of them. There are two things in this letter that are shocking. Number one, it tells them that God's people were placed in Babylon by God. Isn't that what you read? Verse 4, look at this. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away. Look at verse 7. Very similar. Seek the peace of the city whither I have caused you to be carried away captives. God said, listen, you sinned and you got conquered and you got carried away, but I want you to understand something. I put you in that city for a purpose. You're not just there for punishment. Here's the thing. Living in Babylon is an opportunity. Okay? And here's the second thing that would have shocked them, is that God's people had a mission in Babylon. Chapter 29, verse 7, seek the peace of the city, pray unto the Lord for it, for in Babylon's peace you shall have peace. Now, when we think of peace... I think we think of personally a good feeling. I have peace. Or we think of the absence of conflict or war when we think of peace. This Hebrew word for peace 
is incredibly nuanced, incredibly filled with meaning. It is the Hebrew word shalom. You ever heard that before? Jewish people greet each other and they say goodbye with that word. Shalom, right? You know what shalom means? Here's some synonyms for shalom. Welfare, completeness, health, prosperity, rest, harmony, wholeness, tranquility, fullness. One author said this, flourishing, shalom means flourishing in every single aspect of life, physical, spiritual, mental, and emotional. What? God says, listen, the people that conquered you and pulled you away back to their country, the people who only live for war and power and sex and money, who only live for themselves and, and their motto is literally, I'm a God and there's no one else, the people who worship Bell and all the false gods, here's what I want you to do, Israel. Seek their welfare. Seek their flourishing physically, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. Do everything you can to make their lives as good as they can be. And here's the deal, Israel. When you seek to bring Babylon peace, you'll find peace. Which gives a whole new spin on the verse 11, right? Don't we isolate this verse from its context? Don't we put it on a plaque and hang it in our house? And that's beautiful, but look at it. For I know the thoughts I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of shalom and not of evil to give you an expected end. In other words, God is not saying, I really hate them and I really love you. And so don't worry, i got good plans for you. God says, listen, I want to give you peace, but understand your peace is inseparably, inseparably tied to their peace. Woo, y'all tracking with me? Here's what God says. I want you to make lives in Babylon. Serve it. Bless it. Seek its welfare. I want you to retain your unique identity as my chosen people. I want you to be in the city, but not of the city. And y'all, it's right here that we have to speak to something that is a major concern in our churches in 2014 in America. It is awfully easy to get to the point where we're like, what is the Christian life about? It's about avoiding a list of stuff and doing a list of stuff. I don't drink, I don't sleep around, I don't do drugs, I don't go here, I don't do that, I don't watch this. I do go to church, I do give my tithes, I do read my Bible, I do pray, good to go. Well, what is your relation to the world? To stay completely away from it. I don't want them to infect me. I don't want to get too close lest I be assimilated. Now listen, because here's the deal. God's coming to get us soon anyway. Right? And I'm glad for that. Praise God for that. But if you let that mentality drive you to, to separate yourself and isolate yourself from the world, you've done that book a disservice. Hey, he's going to come get us in the rapture anyway, and the whole world's going to hell in a handbasket, so I'm going to be good till he gets here. And friend, listen, oh man, I was thinking all week long, this was the image in my mind. We are standing before Jesus Christ at the Bema seat. We are standing before our Savior and giving account for our lives. And here's what he asks us. How did, you, how did you use your life? My son, my daughter, tell me how you use your life. Well, Lord, I didn't get drunk and I didn't sleep around and I didn't watch R-rated movies and I didn't go here and I didn't do that and I didn't do this. And here's what I did do. I read my Bible and I prayed and I went to church and I did good works and I did all these things. Good, good. What about the lost in your city? 
What about those who I wanted to save by the blood of Christ in your neighborhood? What about those in your family whose blood runs through your veins? Did you give them the gospel? Did you live? Did you do what I put you there to do? Hey, I could have pulled you out the moment you got saved and you would have had all the good Christian music and all the amazing, you'd have had all that you could stand. I left you down there with a mission to impact the world, to seek their peace, to reach them for Christ. Did you do it? No, Lord, but I, I wrote a lot of emails about the government to people. No, Lord, but I watched the news every night and voted for the people I should have voted for. Did you? I'm not, please, I'm not mocking or minimizing these things. What I'm saying is, it is possible to do all of that and be spiritually irrelevant. You weren't left on earth just for that. We are here to seek the welfare of a lost world all around us. Here's two things I want to note. We were placed in our particular life setting by God. The notion of I'm just down here treading water till I get to heaven, really. Right? I, I'm, because of what Adam did in the garden, things are terrible, and I'm just ready to get gone, and I'm just going to sort of do my church thing till I get out of here. God says, no, wait a minute. I put you exactly where I put you with a mission. Listen to Acts 17, 26. God has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. That means God is the creator and sustainer of all. And hath determined the times before appointed. That means God appointed that you and I be alive at this very moment in this generation. And God has appointed the bounds of their habitation. God brought us all here geographically. That means it's no accident you live in your neighborhood. It's no accident you go to your school. It's no accident you're a part of your family. It's no accident you're a part of this church. God put you there, and he put you there with a mission. What's the mission? We are placed in our particular life setting by God. Secondly, we have a mission in our world. Matthew twenty-two thirty-six. 36. See if this doesn't sound like Jeremiah. But this is Jesus talking. Someone said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? What does God really want from us? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And that was the end of the story. God would have loved that, right? Follow God and do right. Avoid idols and chase God. But he went on. Verse 38. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is likened to it. It's inseparably tied to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Treat your neighbor how you want to be treated. Seek, if you want shalom, seek shalom for them. If you want welfare and prosperity and blessing and peace, don't isolate yourself from them. Seek it for them. That's the words of Jesus. Listen to this. Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. As I've often said, hide it under a bushel? No. It giveth light. You didn't get that. You'll get that later. Put it under a bushel. <laughs> But on a candlestick, it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Should I have said it more emphatically? No. All right. Verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Oh, listen. If we're going to stand in a fallen world, 
If we're going to have spiritual integrity, it cannot simply be about me and my life and my walk with God and my spiritual pursuits. All those are important. Let's not minimize one of them. But let's remember we were put here with a purpose not only to enjoy God but to display Him. To seek the welfare and prosperity and peace and hope of the broken people around us and to not be naive and to not be shocked that they act sinful, they're lost. God help us, God help me not to be spiritually irrelevant. Not to one day stand before God and God, I tried, I was good but to do what we're intended to do, bless the world to Christ. What is our mission in life? What is our mission in life? We're winding down to help people become wholehearted followers of Jesus Christ. That's it. We're put here to make disciples. We're put here to so love Jesus and so be caught up in Jesus and so value Jesus that we can't shut up about him. And and by the way we live and talk and walk and serve and love, we draw people who don't love him into a relationship with him. That's our mission in life. We are so prone. Next month is missions emphasis. And we're like, oh, that's great. Missionaries. We're going to get to see missionaries. People that are sent out to go and share Jesus and make disciples. And here's what we miss, my friends. You and I are missionaries too. If you name the name of Christ, you're a missionary to your family, you're a missionary to your co-workers, you're a missionary to your neighborhood. You may be a good one or you may be a bad one, but you are called out by God to be on mission every day of your life. Now listen, some of you are like, preacher, he didn't call me into a pulpit. He didn't call me up here to do what Brandon does so amazingly. He didn't call me to be James or to be be a a, a full-time minister. No, no, no. He might have made you a lawyer. He might have made you a bookkeeper. He might have made you a teacher. But I can promise you this. His one great purpose for you, teacher, is to be on mission for Jesus Christ. Is to so serve those pupils. So live your different values. So shine when you walk into that classroom that they see there's something different about them. And you will be amazed the opportunities God opens up for you to share the reason for your hope in life, Jesus Christ. Wherever you work, wherever you go, you are called through that job, through that family, through your gifts, through your opportunities to be a missionary for God. Here's where I want to close off because that's all real sweet and that's r- real idealistic. And, and I know it's like, yeah, hey, hey, mission accomplished, Pastor. I feel guilty. Yeah, good. I mean, I do. I don't know how anything's going to change. <laughs> But I know I'm not that. How can we be missional? How can we live in the world but not be like the world and still reach the world? How can we love them to Christ? I read a quote the other day that I'm I'm probably going to wind up framing and putting in my office after I clean my office, which really needs to happen at the moment. Because there's no reason to hang up a new plaque when, like, you can't walk in there. Here, here it is, okay? The combination of powerful truth wrapped in self-sacrificing love is what God uses to transform people. The combination of powerful truth wrapped in self-sacrificing love is what God uses to transform people. You know what got me to thinking? Isn't that what Jesus did? When he came down to planet Earth, he didn't just preach, as important as that is. He healed, he cast out devils, he fed, he blessed, he let them know in the most practical of ways, I love you. And then he preached and it had all the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what the apostles did, Paul and John and all those guys? Here's what that entails. We will reach our Babylon. We will reach a very lost world around us 
first of all, with our acts of self-sacrificing love. Someone wrote this, if we have not paid our dues by years of making positive contributions to culture, we simply do not have the cultural clout to pontificate about cultural crises. Let me put that more plainly. Unless we start serving our cities, they're not going to listen to us. The days of going door to door and expecting people to listen to us because we have some sense of morality are over. Do you understand that the Bible Belt is dying? Do you understand that the children coming up, when they have children, the, the days of Christendom in America, unless God brings it back by a miracle, are over. We are on our way to becoming Europe. And unless we get this beautiful one-two punch, serving and loving and helping and working for the good of our cities and neighbors, along with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ, we're not going to make much of an impact. What does that look like for you? Let me ask you. What does that look like for you in your job site? How can you love them? How can you serve them? How can you seek their shalom? What problems are they having that you can address? What lack do they have that you can help? What encouragement do they need that you can provide? And we're thinking the same thing for our city. And next month is about us thinking the same thing for the world. How can we serve them and love them and help them? in practical ways, and then present the powerful, soul-changing truth that God loves them and He can change them and the gospel of Christ can give you a brand new heart. We'll reach them through our acts of self-sacrificing love, through our powerful gospel truth, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, through our prayers. Jeremiah 29, 7, Seek the peace of the city, whither I've caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it. God help us. God help me. Our prayer team, those of you who signed up for prayer team, and you're always wondering, like, you know, when's, when are we going to be called? When are we going to be contacted? When are we going to actually gather and pray? I have the greatest apology to you. Doesn't it seem like we get so busy, that's the thing that goes to the back burner instantly? That's where I hear trying to make stuff happen when all the while God's just waiting so that he can make it happen through us if we seek his face in prayer, if we get humble and get real and beg God to change Grand Prairie and beg God to change our workplace and beg God to invade our families and beg God to do a work around the world. I want to end right here. The greatest example of a person on mission is none other than Jesus Christ. God leaves heaven and he journeys down to earth. And he's born to a virgin mother and he's born in a human body. And he lives 33 years. And listen, he's not assimilated. He always remains holy and pure and powerful and distinctly God's. But he's also not a separatist. Oh, listen, you may be here today, and next month, listen, you're going to be all about, you know, why, why, are, we, why are we doing this stuff over in another country? I mean, you know, America's got its own problem. Why are we trying to reach out to them? There's a lot of you that wouldn't have that attitude, but I know there's some that would. Why are we, why are we going to reach out to them? Because Jesus reached out to you. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't think of us as too dirty and too far gone to save? He made the ultimate missionary journey. He put on our flesh and our clothes and came to live in our mud and blood and dirt. And he interacted with us. And doesn't it, isn't it powerful? You know who loved to be around Jesus? The worst kind of sinners. The prostitutes and the drunkards and the tax collectors, their favorite thing was just to get in close to him and be near him. Why?
because that love of God poured off of him. My prayer for us, my prayer for our church, my prayer for this pastor, we, we can sing the song all day long on this one, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, right? How prone are we to get caught up in our own little routine and just forget about the world around us? You know, sometimes I think it's easier to go in your neighborhood and like tract bomb them, like, like leave a tract. It's way easier to do that than to take four or five years or longer of loving them and pouring into them and, and looking for the chance when God lets you present the gospel of Jesus Christ. God help us to stand in a fallen world and to truly believe the gospel wrapped in self-sacrificing love can change everything, can change everything. Let's all stand. Our musicians are coming. Here in just a moment, this service will be done. And we'll go on about our routines. We've all got routines. We all have things to do. We all have a life to live. My prayer is this morning we'll pause long enough to just open our heart to God and ask the question, am I a missionary? Am I constantly looking for ways to love people to Christ? Am I serving them? We're going to have a lot of opportunities in our church in these days to come starting next month. Not only to serve the church, but to serve the people around us in Grand Prairie. And next month's about the world. Practically, physically, to go there and do it. As well as sending money, which is a beautiful thing. Christian, that's your mission. Have you taken the mission? Or have you gotten a little bit insulated? A little bit separate? A little bit cold, a little bit us against them. Because listen, wherever you're at, if it's us against them, God help us to remember that that wasn't Jesus' attitude. It could have been angel armies and God against sinners, and it wasn't. So this morning, let's pray, let's talk to him, let's let God do whatever he wants to do. And we won't tarry, but we're just going to get real quiet with him now. Let me pray for you, and then we're going to go on with this invitation. If you need to pray at an altar, fantastic. If you need to come down and pray with somebody, that's great. If you need to talk to him right in your seat, let's just take these few quiet moments and do business with God. Lord, thank you for the service. I give it to you. I put no confidence in my words. I, I don't desire to manipulate emotions or minds because I know it won't last past the glass doors in the back, even for me. I won't be able to keep it up. I won't have that motive. I'll just give it away instantly. God, help us. Do a work in us to love the world like you do. To have eyes to see them like you do. Not as too far gone to save, but as people you died for. It's in the beautiful name of Christ we pray. Amen. While we sing, if you need to come, come on. Let's talk to him all over this place. Here I am, down on my knees again, surrendering all. If you need to come, come on. Surrendering all. If you need to step out, come on. And find me here, Lord, as you draw. Desperate for you. I'm desperate for you. I surrender. Drench my soul as mercy and grace unfold. I hunger and thirst. And I hunger and thirst. But 
with arms stretch wide I know you hear my cry speak to me now speak to me now I surrender I surrender I want to know you more I want to know you more I surrender I surrender I want to know you more I want to know you more Like a rushing Jesus, breathe with him. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way in me. Like a mighty storm, stir within my soul. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way, Lord, have your way in me. I surrender, I surrender. I want to know you more. I want to know. These are praying, and those praying, you take all the time you need. Um, what a good day to be in God's house, and, and my, my prayer is for our church and for this pastor that God would, and maybe that third point ought to be the first point, that we would pray and pray and pray and pray for open eyes and open hearts to do what we were put here to do every day, every day. Um, three quick announcements. Read your bulletin because there's a lot going on this week we don't want you to miss, particularly with our, our senior ladies' trip to the fair and, and shut-in ministry and some of those things. So make sure you check your bulletin for dates and times. Uh, we promise to kind of end the service with only three if we can possibly help it. And the first one I want to tell you about is next week, all parents of youth uh, in our youth department um, you've got a meeting next Sunday right after church with James over in the choir room. He promises not to keep you long at all, but you've got a quick meeting over there. Uh, I also want to mention, men, you'll see posters all along the glass out in front uh, for what is being called the Beast Feast, okay? Alliance Baptist Church in Fort Worth, who we believe is going to be one of our key partners in the missions endeavor we're going to describe to you in October. Um, they are doing this as a fundraiser for Mana Worldwide. That means every dollar of the ticket prices is going to feed and give medical help and provide orphanages and start churches um, or help churches that are getting started in, in foreign countries, particularly third world countries. Every dollar of this beast feast is going to go toward the work Mana is doing around the world with this one-two punch of love and the gospel. Okay, and everything they do is tied to the local church. Here's what it's going to be. October the 10th, we're going to take vans and cars at 530. We're hoping for a great group of men. We're going to go to Fort Worth. And this deal, listen, it's just all you can eat. <laughs> it's so weird to say this with piano music. I'm sorry. It's all, <laughs> and it's beautiful, Brandon. I love it. it it's all you can eat meats of every sort. Um, and, and it's just, it's going to be like a, you know, exotic meat type thing. They're going to give away shotguns and kayaks and all that. And our friend Clark Bozier is going to preach there. Uh, so it's going to be a great night. We're hoping to take a bunch of guys with us, um, to benefit manna. And that's going to be on October 10th. You can buy tickets right now in the foyer, credit card, whatever we've equipped for that. And it's a real good cause. I think you'll love it. Um, I kept you standing because this won't be long, but next month, this is announcement number three, October, 
Biggest month of the year, I believe. Um, two Sunday mornings in a row, and then two Sunday nights in a row with dinner over in the family center at 6 p.m. And then a finishing Sunday on the third Sunday of October where we end with lunch. The, t- the title of this mission's emphasis is going to be Mission El Arado. That may not mean a whole lot to you right now, but a whole lot of our one-two punch in worldwide missions of loving people, serving kids, and feeding them, and clothing them, and helping them, and giving them the gospel is what October is going to be all about. So I'm going to ask you, visitors, guests, members, to make October non-negotiable, please. I know there'll be other things to do. If it's at all possible, mark your calendar. There's, there's an insert in your bulletin with all the dates and times. Mark it down and be there. This is just a taste of, of what we're going to have next month uh, in Mission El Arado. Watch this. Guatemala, a land of rich indigenous culture, lush vegetation, and breathtaking panoramic views of volcanic mountains and lakes, is also a land in need. Recent statistics place nearly 80% of the population of Guatemala below the poverty line, and more than 50% below the extreme poverty line, meaning income is not sufficient enough by even a basic basket of food. Poverty is especially prevalent in the rural, indigenous areas of the country. Even more troubling is that a population of over 14 million evangelical Christians make up less than a quarter. Guatemalans are a people in our prayers. They need our hearts. They need Jesus. Amen. Amen. All of, all of those images, including the ones you saw last week, were all shot during our trip to Guatemala. And next Sunday morning, y'all, it's going to be powerful as you see more and hear more from the people who went on that trip. In fact, the people who went on that trip, I need to meet with you real quick like down here at the uh, altar area. Um, we're going to get you right spiritually before you go eat lunch. No, I just need to meet with you. And... Uh, Thank you so much for being here. I want to pray for you. Choir practice at 4.30, church at 6. We'll see you tonight if you can be here. And next week, it's a big one, y'all. Father, thank you for your great blessings. It is our desire to be wholehearted followers of Jesus Christ who help make wholehearted followers of Jesus Christ. So God, this week, help us to see you and share life and serve others. And then when trials come to stay connected, it's in the beautiful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you.